how do we study the effects of, um, of play in, of different kinds? So on one hand, if we get kids to play, can we then see, oh, they've learned this, or they've changed this, or they've developed in, in this way? And on the other hand, if we try to create play intervention, um, how can we then document the effects of changing the play environment doing something? So I looked through the literature and one of the most interesting papers that I was able to find was one by uh, Alexa and uh, Alexa and one of her colleagues on uh, how the number of toys in the play environment um, actually influenced the quality, quality of the children's play or the way that, that kids play. So that kind of finding really got me interested in, in looking at those kinds of methods. So I'm so glad that you were able to come here and uh, share on one hand that study and on the other hand your approach to studying kids and toys through that kind of lens. Thanks so much for coming. So I, I hope that you enjoyed your lunch. I hope that you didn't need your lunch in order to engage with my presentation, nor that your digestion is completely asleep while I speak, um, because I, I do welcome your questions throughout. Um, so feel free to interrupt or um, flag me down. Um, so I am different than the, the presenters you heard this morning and that I'm an experimental researcher by training. Uh, and introduced me that way and I'm comfortable in that role. Um, being an experimentalist, perhaps you might think it's reductionistic and I wouldn't argue. I think it is, but I think that in studying things down at the level that I'll talk about for you, I think it's a piece of a puzzle. That the way I look at things, I don't suggest that it's the way everybody should look at things. And it's not the only kind of literature that I consume when I'm forming my hypotheses or that I think that my findings will interact only at this level, I think, you know, that there's room. So I'm going to say some phrases and define some terms that might sound really narrow, but that's for the purposes of creating an opera operational definition, defining the terminology that I'm talking about so that I can do some measurements, quantitation, but not meant to be judgmental or negative or restrictive to how children play, absolutely by no means. So a little background about myself so that you can hear where some of this is coming from. I trained first as an occupational therapist. Um, there's a different term for that field here. Um, it starts with the phrase ergo, but I won't try to get the rest out or I'll angle it. Um, but do, does it come to mind for all of you? Yeah, we're really, say it again. Thank you. That. Okay. And um, we. Uh, so we work largely with people who have a disease or disability or an injury or developmental delay and helping them to do whatever is important in their everyday lives. That was my first training. And then I practiced as a therapist for a number of years and then went back to grad school where I studied cellular neurophysiology. Uh, and that inspired, gave me my training in empirical research. Uh, and then I came back to wanting to think more holistically on a larger scale, um, so that, that's where I am today. Okay. Uh, play research is a part of my research endeavors and uh, literally the most fun part. So I'm going to give you a model that occupational therapists, a pair of models that have blended to think about how we might approach our clients, but also how I've approached some of the research that I've done in play. Um, using this model to confine the variables that I don't want influencing my outcomes or to um, create an experimental design. And then I'll, I'll use some of my own studies as I go through here. Okay. So Mary Law is an occupational therapist hailing from Canada. And she borrowed from the world of dynamic systems theory to present us with this idea of the person environment task approach. Right? where each of these elements is something that is definable, but not necessarily static, something that changes across time. And when they come to interact with one another, a unique performance would emerge. Okay? So graphically displayed like this in many different writings, not just from Mary Law, but from others, where the individual elements coming together, their overlap or their fit with one another, gives rise to or spawns something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And that's the dynamic system component of it, that these separate systems are interacting. 
and that what you see there is something that you wouldn't see if you were missing any of these elements or if they were changed in some way, then the performance would change. Okay? And we think about our clients this way. You can think about healthy populations this way, of you know, that what we watch people do is arising out of their own characteristics, the world in which they do it, right? their physical interactions, cultural interactions, and then the task. And that may be the hardest one to define, but the task being the meaning and purpose of something. Why did you undertake a thing, right? And what do you expect to have happen at, with, as a result of your performance? This, I think, you could apply to a person in an instant to see what it is that they're doing and to describe it. But you can imagine that in these, uh, especially across time and across space, are layered structures. Right? So I brought in Yuri Bohm from Brenner's idea of nested ecologies. Where in the most proximal, you have only the person, their task, and their environment. But if you step out a little, then you have perhaps the building or the people or the um, intermediate influences on them, what time of day it is or where you need to go next, that kind of idea. Then you could step out from that and say, what community do you live in? What resources are available more broadly speaking? And of course, you could go even farther out and say, what policies? are at play here. What kinds of things might be set aside legislatively to happen, or what kinds of socio-political features or current events might be influencing so that they trickle down into the microsystem. Okay, so I've combined these two. Oh, sorry, my own flow here. Ah, applying this to a child, right, where that internal most microsystem is the child themselves. The next would be their family and their home, moving on to their community and their region. So combining these gives me a model that, um, graphically speaking, is a little bit unsatisfactory for me. I'd like for this outside space to replicate the, the Mickey Mouse head on the, on the inside. Okay. Um, but the idea that we can look inside and watch a child playing and be looking at that microsystem, but needing to understand that there are layers beyond that that might be affecting them. Right? So here, our task person environment becomes the play, right? the concept of what are we doing, why are we doing it, we're playing, the meaning and purpose of that person who's playing is the player. I teach young adult uh, North American, all American um, students, and when I tell them we're going to study players, they're like, oh, it's so inappropriate. No, no, not like a player, right? Not a player, but somebody who's in the act of playing, and the things they play with, and the people they play with. And then their play spaces might be their homes or the playground that they're on in the moment. And then you could go farther and farther out, as we talked about a little this morning, there could be policies at the legislative level that say, you know, this is where play needs to stop, or there could be um, socio, um, social acceptability toward playing, right? So you could add the, the larger layers out there. So I thought we'd take a minute and look at each of these elements, right, and then think about how they're interacting with the idea that it's this thing that combines and emerges that you're all interested in. Like, what is this and how does it happen? And if you wanted to study it, to grasp it, you might be interested in some of the paired interactions or in all three of them. Uh, or you might be interested in what does doing that thing in the middle, what does it result in, what's its impact? So if we had a situation where um, there were restrictions on play, Right? Because uh, perhaps there's it's a child's playing in a war-torn region and it's not safe. Or perhaps they have a developmental disability. Or the toys that they're playing with are um, too complex for their current developmental status. Then you might pull back on any one of those factors in various ways 
and the performance of playing would be smaller, less rich, less intense, less engaged. Uh, that would include, so I've colored the play space here in this restrictive model more lightly so that it's well, impoverished and not providing detail and support. So this circle in the middle, um, the overlap there, is has less color depth. Right? Where in an ideal situation, you might have those factors being pushed in upon. The child has skill in playing or interest, motivation to play. Play is something you know, fast and valued or acceptable and the playmates and playthings are appropriate and they converge together and so you get a richer kind of a play. Play. We've heard a lot about defining play and um, Dr. Sutton Smith's work keeps emerging and I think it's appropriate. I've operationally defined play here to think about child's play. Um, not to say that only children play or that adults can't play like children, but for the purposes of research to kind of define an area that I was interested in. And reading through Dr. Sutton Smith's rhetorics of play that we've heard echoed over and over this morning and through some of the work of occupational therapists who have defined play um, for the purposes of clinical practice. Coming to the conclusion that play is each of these things in various intensities and various settings. So play, you could say, is non-instrumental. When you're engaged in playing, the outcome is interesting and hoped for, but not a factor, not a survival factor. Right? That if you're playing and you get interrupted, um, you, you may be able to pick up later where you left off and you might not be, and that's okay. You'll still have, be able to eat later or to go to sleep or to do whatever else you needed to do. So it's non-instrumental. It's flexible. It can change midstream, as we heard about with the kiddos playing their video games that, or it's Star Wars into sword fighting that you know it's it's allowed to change and that the rules can shift sometimes the play is making the rules and deciding how you know their um, application to the setting okay. i would argue that for a human performance to be labeled as play it has to be fun and that doesn't manifest for everybody in the same way right for some fun is exuberant enjoyment that you can look at and say they're having fun. And other times it's a real internal experience, right? That they may be able to recall later and describe or rate for you, or they certainly can tell you if something hasn't been fun. I think in a given play epic, you might drift in and out of play. In one moment you're playing because it's these things, and in the next moment you move into something more competitive. Right, and that we, you could still say play if they're playing a sport or playing a game, but it becomes about the winning of it, and then they drift back in perhaps to just doing it for the fun of it. So the factors that'll push in on this element would be if play is valued, if it's something that is sanctioned to happen and it is a desired thing, if it's um, encouraged, if it's tolerated. Pulling out on play would be presenting something that's boring. Um, and I don't think that boring's bad. I think that from boredom you know, arises creativity. But in the moment that you're bored, you're bored. And so you're not playing. Right? If you present children with toys that are too easy for them or too babyish, and they'll say, this is boring. Right? And they cannot play. You cannot make them play. Or if it's pressured. right? Sometimes if the, if uh, an outside observer is putting too much pressure on them to play just so, or according to the rules, or um, if they're expected to necessarily learn something from the task that they're involved in, and then it may not be play, and that might be okay, right? The, if the concern might have shifted more toward learning your, your times tables, or uh, a concept of molecular um, construction or something else, but you in that moment, if you're pressured to learn, then it's perhaps not playing. Okay. So here's an, an example of how we felt that we created play by creating fun, and we measured it. Okay. So play with messy substances is something that happens in early childhood, 
um, through you know maybe early elementary school. Uh, the age for a while had shifted down to where 10, 11, 12 year old kids would say we don't play with messy stuff. Um, but then, I don't know, maybe it didn't happen here, but in the US we had this phase where girls especially, but boys too, were um, obsessed with slime. Yes, making slime with borax and glue and so messy play sort of reemerged. Um, and I don't know how long it'll stick around, but mud pies and playing in the bathroom while I'm taking a bath with uh, all kinds of hygiene products, that sort of thing. Messy place, a thing that kids do. And for most kids, it's fun. It's intrinsically motivating. It's um, non-instrumental and certainly flexible, right? But there's a subpopulation of children for whom that tactile experience of touching messy play may not be fun. It may be aversive to them. And so they may fall under this umbrella of sensory processing disorder, yeah, where they're, the way they bring information into their sensory systems is different in ways that we don't entirely understand yet, if it's you know, what level of the brain or what level of psychology might be interacting, but what to others is a neutral or even fun experience becomes an aversive one for them. They feel like they don't want to touch messy substances, and when they do, they feel discomfort that could be measured through increases in their heart rate and respiration, their sweat responses, and so what you know is fun for everyone else, messy play is not fun for them. Well, messy play, play is, should be voluntary and intrinsically motivated, but lots of times kids are presented with, here's something messy and fun to play with, sand tables in preschool programs and shade and cream, all kinds of stuff, and they're negatively judged perhaps as being picky or controlling or um, non-compliant if they don't want to play. So, we set up a scenario where we invited five to 10 year old kids to come to our research lab and play with messy substances. In one situation, we just put the messy substances on the table um, with a control figure, something similar um, to the experimental, and all the instructions we gave were play with this for as little or as long as you want to, touch it as much or as little as you want to. We videotaped them, and um, measured what they did. In the experimental situation, the instructions we gave them were, here, let's do something. Let's pretend that, and we use the word pretend. Let's pretend to put mustaches on the face using shaving cream. We had nine other substances, similar kinds of control geometric sorts of images to play with, and then um, something that evoked meaning. Typical kids, typically healthy, developing kids in this study, these two conditions were the same for them. Their play under both conditions was the same. They were, their affect was as positive, their, um, you know, the duration with which they played was as long. It's really coming down. <laughs> Our kids who, um, whose parents had completed a standardized, um, questionnaire on the sensory profile and measured to be statistically different than typical on the factor of sensory sensitivity. For them, this difference in how we presented it changed how they played with the messy substance. Right? And specifically in our quantification of initiation. Right? We measured it, we rated their initiation on the video on a one to five scale where a five was the kids were diving in before we got the instructions out, right? No pause, no hesitation, up to their elbows right away, right? And a one was avoidance type behaviors. They were all really, really pleasant and um, engaged, charming children in the study, but they would talk the pants off the researcher to avoid having to touch that stuff, right? <laughs> Looking out the window, sometimes sitting on their hands, Right? or tucking them under their armpits so that they weren't having to touch in the control experiment. Right? And a three is you know, that they, um, they might invite the researcher to play first, like you do it first and then I will. Right? So in our no meaning condition, you know, the initiation was between that one and two. 
And when we sit here, let's do this. Let's pretend, or let's make this thing that is otherwise not play, let's make it into play. And they jumped in a little bit more quickly. And they're in the, in the pretend condition. And their scores were pretty comparable to our control population. The player, right? Player is some, you know, the person engaging in the performance. And we need to consider their, how they're presenting in the moment, what their history is, and where they're headed. Right? So we can break this down as a clinician might into their developmental domains. In any moment, what are their motor skills? Gross motor and fine motor. Do they pick up small toys and manipulate them? Do they climb over? Can they climb up? Can they be safe about it? Their sensory perspectives, so their uh, ability to receive sensory input and then how they process it, and then what meaning they may assign to it. So their perceptual abilities, right? What they, um, their ability to create the idea of play. And their emotional state is important, both in the moment and perhaps their overall emotional health. And their cognitive function. So can they attend to the play task or are they distracted? Um, what knowledge do they have about the play scenario that's being created? So it's really hard to join your friends in playing, um, I don't know, somebody give me an example of a game that kids might play. Yes? Very hard to join Shoots and Ladders if you don't know the rules. Did you say Snakes and Ladders or Shoots? Snakes? Snakes and Ladders. Snakes and ladders. Maybe it's, um, we might call it, our game is Shoots and Ladders. Is it the same? Yeah, you know? Same. Yeah? Okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. Just want to be sure I'm speaking the same language, so to speak. Right? So it, it's hard to join in that game if you don't know the rules, if you don't know the context, if you don't know the setup and the, and the, the end design, the end goal of it. So you need to have knowledge, and then as you're playing, you need to have information processing capabilities. So bring in the information, make a decision about what to do next, or what it means for the next stage of your play. Okay. We need to consider our clients, our cli from a clinical perspective, our clients, from a, uh, a you know, world perspective, the population, the people who are playing, what's their health and wellness status? Right? Um, if you've ever, well, if, of course you have, you felt ill on a day, right? You might feel less inclined to play. Um, kids who have chronic illness, sickness, may be less inclined to play. Chronic disability, a little bit different, right? Once they're feeling healthy and well, it seems that, you know, they adjust for any of the factors above and are able to play. And then playfulness, right? The capacity to be able to play. Um, Takata and Knox have written about, um, and actually all of them, Bundy in the American literature about playfulness as something that we could model, right? By considering manifest evidence of intrinsic motivation. Right? So the, this is something I want to do. I want to go play. Let's go do it. A sense of internal locus of control. Not always, and not throughout a whole play epic, but the idea that I have the capability of creating here. And this is not something being done to me, that I am an active member uh, or an active contributor to this performance, a suspension of reality. Right? Um, my, the ability to pretend that you're Superman, that you can fly, that you can defy gravity and move through space. That also allows children to suspend the rules mid-game and to change the game from one to another because they created a reality and now they're changing realities. So they need to suspend even their own reality. And then framing. Framing would be uh, the interaction between two players, being able to express and pick up on cues, right? That I just told a joke, wink, wink, nod, nod. Did you get it? I didn't, you know, I didn't mean it, but you know, I, I said something. It was a joke. Or I can read by your facial expression, the way one eyebrow went up there, the way you said, you know, your tone changed at the end, that you were telling a joke, 
and that makes it okay, right? So play fighting, for example, comes with a lot of framing, that we don't mean this. I'm not really trying to kill my mother. I'm not really intending to um, call somebody something unkind. We're playing at it, so we frame it. I can give my cues to you. I can read the cues that you give me. So these are elements that you might consider, right? So that this is why play across a lifespan would look really different. Why young children's play looks really different than middle childhood, and then adolescence, and then adult play, because all of these factors are going to be changing. But whether a person can be a player in any given moment is going to obviously influence the performance that emerges. So a capable player would be someone who has skill, who has knowledge, who has problem-solving abilities and frustration tolerance, who is feeling well in the moment, and who has some playfulness about them. Where a not capable player may have a characteristic about them that diminishes their skill, they may be feeling well, unwell, sorry. or they may be, at the moment, not playful, or temperamentally not playful. Okay? So their play performances may be less supported by the characteristics they're bringing to the engagement. Okay. Playmates, who do you play with? Um, what are their interests? Do you share interests together? Right, so that you can agree on what to play? Or do your interests differ and that creates an opportunity to negotiate with one another about what you'll be playing? Do you have matched or dissimilar capabilities? And neither is bad, right? Matched capabilities might mean that you can engage in something jointly, but dissimilar characteristics might give you different roles in the, in the game that you're playing or play that you're engaging in at the moment. And, uh, are both players similarly playful? Then the toys, the external things that you play with, the thing that we all came here today on account of. Um, I would argue that a toy needs to be safe, but that doesn't mean it has no risk. That means that you can engage in an epic of play without bodily harm that's going to change your life's trajectory. Okay. Uh, it's okay to fall, it's okay to bump, it's okay, you know, but you shouldn't um, go to the emergency room because of um, the quality of a toy, right, in a predictable way. Say, right? A toy should be appealing, something that has kind of a come hither sort of a quality to it. A come explore me, come see what I am, come, you know, I, I looks like a thing you'd want to go and touch. A characteristic you might evaluate about a toy is, is it novel or is it familiar? And there are pros and cons, right? A novel toy that isn't intimidating can, ins can be very appealing. Something that, oh, that's new. I need to go see that. I need to go and touch it and, you know, find out what happens when I play with it. Or if it's too new, it may be like, well, I'm just going to hang back and watch and see what someone else does, right? A familiar toy can be very useful in play because you can recreate what it does for you or change it in that flexibility sort of a way. So you play with it one way one time and the next time you play with it changes. Or a familiar toy can be boring. Like I've already explored everything that toy has to offer and I am finished with it. I don't want to see it again. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm pleased at how often the term affordance has already come up. I didn't know quite frankly, that it was so widely used outside of the motor learning community. So I'm happy not to have to explain it. Um, but I will say that an affordance is only an affordance if a person can perceive it to be so. Okay? There are loads of things that you could do with a toy that you won't ever do if you didn't know it had that affordance. If you didn't, uh, if you'd never pressed the button that way because you didn't know it was a button, right, then you couldn't interact with it. And I don't have this in my own research, so I didn't want to present it, but 
children on that under that sensory processing disorder umbrella, one of the ways that they manifest is in their challenges to motor plan, to ideate um, a way to interact with something and then create that performance. And a lot of it boils down to this fear of I'm afraid to break it because I don't trust that my body is going to use this toy correctly and so I'm just not going to explore it. I'm going to be very hands off about it. Leaving, bringing us to the idea of responsiveness. The responsiveness is how hard do you need to work to get the, to capitalize on the affordance. And again, no one right answer. Sometimes you want a challenge to it. You want to have to dig through in that play experience to get the thing to happen that you're trying for. And other times you may want it to be more effortless. So how did it arrive? And then the complexity or the simplicity of the toy. Does it do one thing and it's, uh, you might say, a one-trick pony? Or does that toy do many things? You can use it in many different ways in many different play scenarios. Okay. So we could facilitate play by providing or assuring that children have playmates who are, are uh, supportive of one another's play, who don't over-challenge one another, who um, allow one another to make mistakes, or to change the rules, or to express themselves during the play, um, and by providing toys that have the right level of novelty and appeal and affordances in their responsivity, or we could inhibit play, right, by providing over, or by having, maybe not providing, overly uh, criti critical playmates, right, who are going to make fun of the way you're playing, and so you wouldn't want to do that in front of them. Uh, or they may have interests that don't align with yours. Um, Heather Miller Kahanek interviewed seven and eight-year-old kids about what's fun, what what makes play play, you know, and in that they talked to, and a lot of gender differences in play emerged, where the girls looked at what the boys were doing and said, I don't even think that looks like fun, <laughs> right? Like, what are they doing? And the boys, the same comment, looking at the girls and going, that just looks silly, that, you know, not silly good, silly like, oh, I don't want to do that, so mismatch of interests, right? Or, you know, having friends who aren't playful, playmates, I should say, who in the moment aren't up to playing or who temperamentally don't have any of the characteristics of playfulness. And the toys could inhibit play by being too challenging or too boring or unsafe. Um, so you can push in and out on any uh, on that axis as well. Play spaces should, I would also argue, be safe and that they shouldn't cause overt injury through usual activity. Um, I agree with the notion that play spaces should provide some risk, right? Some opportunity to say, hey, look, mom, no hands. Right? Look what I did. I got out there and I tried and it worked. And you might fall, right? But you won't die from falling, right? So some amount of safety. Um, is it a place where play is sanctioned? Or is it a place where in order to play, you're breaking a rule or you're sneaking? And again, it could go either way as being good or bad, right? Place, sanctioned play spaces happen in homes. And they happen on playgrounds. Um, Non-sanctioned play spaces sometimes yield the best play, right? Sneaking into the graveyard to play hide-and-go-seek at night, right? Not sanctioned, um, but still, you know, a play that can occur and will change the element. Is the play space shared with others? Uh, or do those others become your playmates, or are they playing nearby? Is it shared for other functions, right? Or a kitchen can become a play space. Um, if somebody's cooking and the kids are pulling out the, the pots and pans and then you can have the spoons. Um, so, or is it simply a designated play space? Here's where you play, here are your play things, this is where you do it. Um, as an occupational therapist, pretty concerned with our play space is inclusive and accessible. Right? So accessible means you have a disability and you can get here, and that's great, and you're welcome. Right? Inclusive means it, there's some amount of universal design to it, where you can not only be here physically, but you can play too. There are things that will allow you to engage as a player. And sometimes that means it needs to be resourced. So 
appropriate play spaces or push in on the overlap, maximize the fit, and restrictive play spaces will pull out and discourage play from happening. Bringing us to what is it that we observe when these three things start to interact with one another? What dynamic performance emerges and it's playing? And playing, really, if we go back to how we define play, means that a person is having fun and that they're actively engaged. In the messy play study, at the end of every session, we asked our participants, on a scale of one to five, how much fun did you have today? And we taught them how to use that Likert scale by showing them to anchor um, their least favorite food at a one and their most favorite food at a five. So we had lots of broccolis down at ones and pizzas up at fives. And your least favorite experience, like going to the dentist as a one and going to the amusement park as a five. And their parents said, yes, they are using that scale reliably. And then we get to the end of our messy play se session and we'd say, how much fun did you have? What did they all say? What do you think? Five. Every single kid in the whole study, every single session, five. And so I felt as if they were trying to please us, right? trying to um, show that they've been good little research participants and that they, uh, you know, that they were being nice and that the student, the student researcher who'd conducted the session had done a nice job. So a five. So we could not ask them, I mean, we couldn't say, you know, rate their play, the quality of their play, according to whether or not they had fun, because only they can say whether or not they had fun, and they all said a five. We had a complete ceiling effect. And I don't mean to suggest that children are dishonest, but though I didn't feel that those were data that we could use, so we had to look from outside and use those Likert rating scales um, on things that we could replicate and document, so initiation and affect. Um, joint attention, persistence, those sorts of measures. And then in that messy place study, initiation was the one that differed between the meaning and the no meaning condition. Um, I think that you could design a metric that could measure fun and engagement um, from children of different ages, but our I tend to do research with younger children and I don't think that their self-report of that was fun or not. Um, and I don't want to interrupt them while they're doing it and say, are you having fun, right? Because then I'm destroying the study, yeah? And, um, and they're going to just say yes, I think. Right? Yes, I'm, I'm having fun. Fine. So why do we care? Well, I think it's OK if we kind of don't care what comes out of play. In other words, let play be play in some circumstances. That's OK. It's good, fine, let's do it, right? We don't, not everything in our lives do we have to do because we derive some impact from it. That's okay, but I think there are great things to be derived from play, and clearly this is self-confirming that you're all here, or, um, and I don't have to work hard to convince you that good things come out of playing. Right, so across the literature, you can find positive results from play among all these various things listed here, right? And it would depend which ones you wanted to measure and which ones you wanted to hypothesize the effect size of play, but you could say, you know, kids who play thusly learn thusly, or kids who play accordingly have better skill, or kids who play accordingly have psychological adjustment, right? You, and there's a little, the little bit of literature to support all of that. One of my favorite writers in occupational therapy is Mary Riley, and she just says that play begets mastery. That, yes, you'll get all of these things, but the, the, the thing that emerges from those is this sense of self-efficacy. This, if I did that, there's no limit to what I could do next. I, I had a successful play experience, and that's going to snowball into my next playful experience, and into my next and my next. So play begets mastery, and it may beget mastery in multiple 
domains. We have one little bit of evidence to contribute to, yes, there's good things that come out of playing. So the population of children with hearing impairment has been tracked longitudinally for um, decades, and a consistent adult outcome for them is poor literacy. And with the concept of early intervention being that the earlier you start to provide therapeutic methods or teaching, the better you can impact those outcomes in the long range. So what can we do early to promote literacy for adults with hearing impairment? So there's a bunch of methodological approaches to making storybook reading more interesting for young children with hearing impairment. Honestly, part of the problem early was in convincing parents of young children with hearing impairment to read to their children because they didn't feel like it was a valuable thing to spend their time doing because they perceived that their child was not benefiting from that experience. And so the, the child would wander off and the parent would chase after them reading the book or say, no, you just have to sit here while I read um, because I've been told, right? And one of my colleagues referred to this as the broccoli effect, that you just have to sit here while I read to you the same way that you have to eat your vegetables with dinner. Um, so that really wasn't an effective approach to increasing um, interaction or increasing the participation or even the implementation of storybook reading. So she and some, um, Mikulski and some of her previous research made the book more interactive, right? made it more of, of a play-based book, the books that have dials or flaps or textures to touch and turn. And she had some success um, with that. I wondered if we couldn't contextualize the storybook with play. So in our study, we had preschool children with hearing impairment. And they came, again, into a laboratory space. And they played with a student researcher for about um, 10 to 15 minutes, entirely child-directed play. Right? It wasn't the researcher trying to tell them, here, play this, do this, let me teach you about this toy, or show you, but just here are some toys, let's play together. And then closed the book and said, or sorry, put the toys in the toy box and said, time for a story. And then they sat and read together. Yeah. And the student researchers did a really good job of standardizing their reading to the children, reading the book the same way every time. What we changed from one condition to the other is what toys they played with. In the experimental condition, the toys matched the book. So here you see that we read the book, It's the Bear, where a young boy goes on a picnic with his mom into the woods, and she has forgotten their dessert and heads back to the car, and while she's gone, a bear comes out of the woods, and the boy gets scared, hides in the picnic basket, the bear leaves, mom comes back, what are you doing in the picnic basket? There's a bear, there's no bear, and then you know, the, in the climax of the book, the bear comes out and takes the pie. So in our matched condition, we found picnic baskets, we found bear, boy doll, very difficult to find, um, of the, the right scale and proportion to play with, uh, and decorated the walls to look like a forest. Right? The control condition, these toys were put away, and we had toys that didn't match the book at all. Right? Um, we had a safari theme. So the same number of toys, the same wall decoration, same scale of toys, but lions and zebras and um, ferns for the animals to hide in and the, the characters were dressed for safari. Okay. Again, for our typically developed children, the condition didn't matter. They engaged in the storybook reading the very same un after either kind of play. Right? But for our kids with hearing impairment, they engaged in that storybook really differently after having played with toys that matched. And we went straight from one to the other, where they were more excited to turn the page and find out what happened. They pointed at the elements of the picture book with, you know, and asked more questions about it, pointed even in some of our kiddos to the words. And you know, we're interested in what does this text say on the page. 
So our conclusion was that play had provided the context in which they now had some connection to something that they didn't have connection to previously. And now it was more interesting to have a story read to them about those elements. Again, we measured engagement on five point scales. And we added affect, right? They're a level of positivity um, ranging from one to five, where one would be overt negative affect, crying, avoiding, pushing, um, and a five being glowingly happy and excited. And joint attention, which would be that they and the reader together were attending to the storybook. So there was some interaction where a one would be that the reader is reading along in the standardized way and the child's not maybe not attending, not interrupting, not asking for the reader to look here or look there. Where a five, they become, it's not that they take over, they didn't take the book from the reader, but they become richly engaged with the reader during that process. We had an increase for, again, the kids with hearing impairment, but not the typical development. I know it's not what you were looking for, but uh, interested if you speculate when they were when they were playing with the soft toys. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any sort of trends on like how they played and then their behaviour during the storytelling time? That's a great question. And in this study, we didn't really look at um, say their playfulness or the way they used the toys. Um, I have the data. It would be interesting to go back to it in that regard. Um, and no, no trend emerged like from individual kids. My student researchers felt that the kids with hearing impairment were a little less believing that they were in control of the situation. Right? So it, the play session was not directive. Not here, do this, but here are some toys and I'm going to sit here. And their instructions, the student researcher was, if the child initiates a play that brings you in, join them, but don't make any effort to advance it or to further it. And they felt like those kiddos would sometimes come to a stopping point and look at, like, you know, well, what do I do next? Right, looking for some direction, but I can't say whether or not that's a significant observation. Yes, please. My question so uh, if this and this these experiments, are these the three the design signs of this or within something? Both. Right. So as happens, my sample sizes and perhaps the metric I'm using always gives me non parametric data. Right, so I cannot use a 2A ANOVA, but I use a Wilcoxon and... Um, well, also the experimental design. So oh! Is the kid's design growth or what? Yes, always, always. Because I think there's individual variability in how a child plays, and so I feel that you can only compare them to themselves under two different circumstances. Um, I, I think that large-scale studies could be done that compare you know, populations of kids under two different circumstances. But my studies are never quite large enough, so I always put the same kid in both conditions and in random order. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Really good question. And I don't always have a control sample, right? A healthy, typically developing kids, or sometimes healthy, typically developing kids are the sample, and I don't have a clinical population. But when I do have both, I do between and within. Um, statistical analysis. All right, bringing us to the study that um, att attracted the attention to bring me here. Right. And so here's the backstory on this study. Um, so I was in, uh, as an occupational therapist, let's start there, um, lots of times people will approach me because they know that as an OT I work with young children and they'll say, this is what's wrong with my kid, what do I do, where am I going wrong, please help me, you know. And I would, because perhaps of the idea of early intervention, that if we get involved sooner we have better outcomes later, 
parents of young children particularly are coming and saying, is everything okay? Is my kid normal? Are we doing this right? And I, I and my colleagues, we you know, kind of have our private blogospheres, right, where we compare notes, what are parents asking you about? And we're really commonly being approached by the parents of toddlers asking, does my child have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And I get a little snarky sometimes, and I say, yes, <laughs> because your toddler's a toddler, <laughs> right? Um, and maybe we don't need to pathologize toddler behavior because it doesn't look like preschool behavior or five-year-old behavior or you know teenage behavior. All you know, but there's still this concern. But the other thing that I hear them say, you know, I ask, you know, why why are you concerned that your child has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And they say because they don't play well. And what do you mean by that? Well, we have, and here's the quote I get a lot: all these toys and they never play with them. Hmm. I have heard it from more than one parent, more than one um, other therapist, or teacher, or child care provider, babysitter, all these toys, and they never play with them. Okay. The other part of the backstory is that I'm the mother of twins. They were born while I was in graduate school, which is a crazy thing to do. Um, and we lived in a small downtown Chicago flat. Um, and they were planned for and all of that, but what I hadn't planned for was all the stuff that comes with twins, right? All the stuff that comes with a baby anyway, but then times two, right? And so before they arrived and all through their first year, we're, you know, shoving things into shelves and on, um, behind cupboards and in kitchen pantries that I never thought I'd put things in, never thought I would need, right? Just to clear space to walk. And part of this was self-inflicted, you know, I made two bouncer seats, maybe I really didn't, two cribs, maybe not, you know, but we brought some of it in, and some of it we didn't bring in. Some of it came to us. Family members whose children were older and said, here, you need all the toys that my kids are done playing with. And they came to our house or grandparents visiting and bringing a present just because they visited. Or, and I didn't know that this happened before I had my own kids, you go to someone else's birthday party, and maybe it's not like this everywhere, but you, you come home with a gift, right? It's a party favor. And so we had this growing, you go to a restaurant uh, for a meal, and sometimes it will come with a toy and not just at McDonald's, right? And then you get, um, you know, Happy Meal toys, yes, but bringing home stuff from nearly everywhere you can go. And so then I started hearing these parents who say, we have all these toys and my kid doesn't play with them. And I started seeing how that happens in homes, how you have all this stuff. And I thought, yeah, there's a hypothesis here. Maybe they're not playing with them isn't the child characteristic. Perhaps it's the environment, right? In this person environment task model, it could be that the child's you know, appropriately developed and the environment's the problem. So this is a hypothesis and we can test hypotheses. Okay? In the person environment, environment, um, Sorry, here's an environment task, I mean, we would say occupation. Uh, model, right, play, player, play things. Here, we've decided to, that we're gonna study toddlers. Okay, so we need to look at the, play, the player and the playmates of toddlers. Play for toddlers, maybe differently than other epics of life, is highly valued almost universally. It's a protected activity that most toddlers are allowed to and in fact encouraged to participate in. Right? It is something that we have high tolerance for in a variety of our spaces, where a behavior by a, a five-year-old or an eight-year-old might put others off by a toddler Society is going to go, oh, that's cute, right? That's fine. Keep, no, no, don't worry. Let him keep playing, right? So toddlers might have more leeway to play in places that other children don't. Uh, and this is because as a society, generally speaking, we anticipate the benefits of play for toddlers. So it, the, that component of the model is not a restrictive factor. 
toddlers as players are quite capable. And in fact, it's a really fun epic of play for them because their developmental domains are changing rapidly toward the increasing side. Right? They can do today what they couldn't do yesterday. They're adding words to their vocabulary. They're increasing their understanding of grammatical structure. They're gaining skill in gross motor and fine motor capabilities. And along with this comes a push for um, autonomy. I do it myself, kind of don't, mom, I don't want your help. I want to do this, right? This kind of let me go at it. And that's a perfect mindset for playing, right? Intrinsically motivated, try to get a toddler to do something that they don't want to do, right? And it, it's possible, but it's harder, right? Play, not a, not a problem. They're intrinsically motivated to go do it. But attention, attention for them is in this dynamic phase where they're really moving from what attention looks like in infants to what attention looks like in older children. So attention in infants is exogenously driven. Something from the outside world will captivate an infant and they are almost unable to pull their attention away from it. If you've held a baby and walked past a bright window or a ceiling fan, you've seen how their eyes get drawn to it and they're almost stuck looking at it. Sometimes it will even distress them. They wish they could look away. They're most naturally drawn to faces, right? They look in the world for faces, latch onto them, especially their caregivers, right? Mom, dad, grandparents, right? They find their faces, they're captivated by that and you know, may even struggle to look away. Compare that to the attention of an older child who has ideation, who says, here's a thing that I want to go do. I want to go pretend that I'm going through the back of the wardrobe to uh, you know, a fantasy land, or I want to build the tallest bridge I've ever built out of my construction materials. And they ideate and they set about doing it, and sometimes it's difficult to interrupt them from doing it, right? You call them to dinner, no thanks, I'm busy, I'm playing, right? They may even have a bathroom accident because they don't want to stop their playing to go to the bathroom and come back. Their, their attention is intrinsically driven, they're directing it, and they're focusing it. Toddlers are in this middle land, right? Between being captivated by the elements of their external environment and having plans of what I want to do I'm going to direct my attention to something. I'm going to explore its affordances and do its things. Okay. Uh, playmates for toddlers tend to be people older than them, right? Uh, who facilitate their play, right? who maybe supervise them to keep them safe, but if they enter into playing with them, they're facilitating the play of the kiddo. Right? When it comes to playing with peers, they engage in parallel play. You did your thing. I'll do my thing, it's okay that we're doing this thing together in our shared space. They're play spaces. Doris Pierce interviewed parents of toddlers and preschoolers and asked them, where do your children play? And the answer was everywhere. They play everywhere we go, in the grocery cart, in the back of the car, um, along the street, in, you know, everywhere we go, they play. Oh, okay. But what else? Well, I find play important, parents said, so I've created space in my home for them to play. They have a play area. It's stocked with toys, and parents reported that um, I feel it's my job to stock that play space. I seek out toys to put there. I cultivate the collection of toys that are there. I weed out the inappropriate ones. Okay. Um, and then play things. Toys, yes, in the commercial sense, but also just about anything that they can safely interact with. So yes, sticks and pine cones and um, store food storage containers and pots and pans and tissue boxes and anything that they can get their hands on and be allowed to play with can become a toy. But as I was telling you in my own home, there can be quite an abundance of toys 
And this may not be true universally, I understand that, but I think that um, many cultures have this phenomenon of having many, many toys, because we value play. And if you value play and you understand that toys are playthings, then you would bring more in. Right? And electronics in various phases, right? I do not mean to exclude them. They just happen not to be the focus of this study. Right? So here's the hypothesis, right? That an environment with fewer toys would lead to higher quality play. That sounds awfully judgmental, the quality of play. But think of it just from an empirical researcher's point of view. That um, we wanted to measure play, and parents were saying to me, my child doesn't play, and so we wanted to capture it, so we called it the play, we called it the quality of play as the dependent variable. And then we broke that down to uh, mechanistic features that I'll discuss in just a little bit. And our independent variable was the number of toys. So we invited toddlers, right? Um, it's, we invited around two years, plus or minus six months. Okay, so 18 to 30 month old toddlers, recruited by convenience in the greater Toledo area, um, to come to our play spaces, right? Where the entrance feels like you're walking into a college campus building where there's classrooms and offices, not a clinical sense where you feel like you're visiting the doctor or going into a laboratory um, with unusual looking apparatus. Um, and the playroom, I'll describe it a little bit, but it, you know, was clearly designed for play. They came three times. We tried to keep their three visits really short but distinct from one another. The first visit, the purpose was to get to know us and to see our playroom and to be comfortable with the space. Right? Also remember that toddlers may have separation anxiety and stranger anxiety and we didn't want to influence their play because of those unfamiliar factors. So they came and they got to explore the room as much as they wanted um, with their parents and we did a developmental screening. And they came back two other times to play with our toys. And so we had toys, they came and played with them. We said play as little or as long as you want um, and offered up to 30 minutes to the parents. Right? They stay here this long. All of our toys were sit and play toys uh, and manipulative toys and we video recorded them. So we had 36 kiddos come that they ranged in the whole age range, um, 18 to 30 months, but averaged right around our two-year mark. Uh, it did happen and that more of them were female than male, and that many more of them were white than otherwise. The Hollings had four-factor socioeconomic scale as a way to ask families about their socioeconomic status without asking how much money do you make, what's your income. And we rated their socioeconomic factor on his scale, which ranges from 8 to 66, and they came in at a 48, so upper middle class participants. And we used the Battelle to measure their developmental status. To, um, we had as an inclusion factor that they were typically developed kids. And the Battelle is scored where zero would be the peak of your normal distribution curve and one would be one standard deviation plus and minus one one standard deviation below and so on and so they scored um, motor wise within a standard deviation they were a little bit high um, but maybe not statistically when you take in variation on personal social and cognitive domains um, perhaps relating to their rather privileged life situations um, most of them had siblings, some younger, some older siblings. What we concluded from this was that they should be capable of being players, right? that they were presenting with those personal characteristics that said this population should be able to come and play. And we asked them, well, do you? Right? We asked their parents, um, does your home have a dedicated play space where most specifically said yes, and some here reported, yeah, they can play anywhere they want to. And a minority said, no, we haven't necessarily set aside a play space. How many toys do you have in your home? 
Those of them, I wish I'd asked this question better. I wish I'd asked them all for a number. It was just an open-ended, how many toys do you have? And some gave a number, so we were able to create an average. But um, many just said, yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> who do they play with? Where their parents were the largest number. I don't know who the, the one parent who was not a play partner to their peer was, but I'm guessing it's one of these who had lots and lots of siblings. Right, and it didn't feel that they were needed in, as a play partner. And then what are their favorite toys? We had some idea what the answer to this question was going to be because we explored it with pilot data, but we wanted to be sure because we wanted to be sure not to include their favorite toys in the study because right? that would perhaps bias the way they played with the toys. the toys that we used. As I said, we wanted not to have any of their favorites, so we didn't go to the current toy story, toy store to buy the toys that we bought, but we went to garage sales and people's basements and said, you know, please give us toddler toys that you're done with. And then we took, we probably went through a hundred toys to choose the ones that we did, and we vetted them against a checklist um, published by the American Occupational Therapy Association. And these are the categories on which that we evaluated them, particularly looking that um, we didn't feature any commercial characters in our study, and we worked hard to find toys that didn't have a gender bias. And we categorized toys right, by the feature that they were most, yes? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> certainly, yes. Where many more, where this um, 13 of the parents reported that dolls were their favorite toys, I was probably about 10 girls into that category. Um, and vehicles was more common for boys than it was for girls, but there were some girls in that subsection of, of their kitchen fell pretty evenly. Building blocks fell pretty evenly. And then it, when it's fewer than that, um, reporting it's their favorite, I, I wouldn't be as comfortable saying. Okay. We've got these toys. We divided them by asking other people, what do you think the primary feature or function of this toy is? Okay. So we had educational toys, toys that would teach some concept like colors, shapes, or numbers. We had pretend toys that overtly suggested use this in a scenario of play, of pretend play. We had action toys that were a little bit less specific in how they should be used, but for building and construction or hammering or that kind of thing. And then we had vehicles because they were so ubiquitous as um, toddler toys. Okay, so here are the 36 toys that we used for educational are at the top, and obviously vehicles here at the bottom. Uh, and the ones with red boxes were our battery-operated toys, where we didn't have many. We were really going for those traditional sit-and-play types of toys, just to control from one toy group to another. We have these all on a shelf. They each have a number. And we would invite the parents in to see the shelf and say, is any of these specific toys your, parent, your child's favorite? And if they said yes, we would have pulled it off the shelf and it wouldn't be included in their setup. Okay. Then, as I said, the condition was randomized. Some participants' first visit had four toys, and some, their first visit had 16 toys. And then we randomized which toys they played with. So in the four toy condition, they got one from each category, and they wouldn't see that toy again. And in the 16 toy condition, they got four from each category. Our playroom was designated as a play area by having four walls and a door, naturally lit with sunlight, um, a, child, a soft surface on the floor, child-friendly furniture and familiar to the child. They've been there before on their previous visit. The play, to ensure that it was play, was child-directed. 
So their parents could be in the room if they needed for emotional comfort and support, or they wanted to be with their child during research participation. Um, but they didn't have to be. If the child separated from their parent, they could. Researchers stayed in the room, sat on the floor in the corner, and did not direct the child. And this is how we trained the parents, too. If your child approaches you to play with them, absolutely play. But don't try to further or advance the play scenario. Right? And when they're done, you let them be done. Right? Don't make any intervention approaches with them. Okay, so it was child-directed play. And, as I said, we felt like our kiddos were, our participants were able to be players. Right? They were developmentally appropriate, and they had clearly a rich history of being exposed to the concept of play. And now, so they came, they played, and we videotaped them, and then we needed to measure the results. Right? And being an experimentalist, I wanted to quantify. So we, just, we settled on our dependent variables, and we worked together um, to operationalize those, to have a standard definition for this is the dependent variable, this is when we will say it's occurring, and how it's occurring, and this falls outside of there. And then amongst the research team, we trained one another, here's what I'm seeing. Um, different students took the lead on different of our dependent variables and trained the others to see as they saw. And then we measured inter-rater reliability by having some subset of the data measured by two people and then they're uh, calculated a linearly weighted Kappa statistic. So here's what we measured, an incident of play. They approached a toy and they played with it in some observable manner. Then how long that incident lasted, where we began at the moment they touched it, so we needed a starting place, but their hands could come off during the incident as long as their attention remained focused on it. So our cameras were set up at various angles so we could see that they were still focused. And even if they'd stopped touching it, that incident might have continued because they were you know, talking about it or um, you know, bringing their parent in to play with them or combining toys, but they were still engaged in that incident. And then we measured manners of play, and this gets at that affordances piece. How many verbs could we use to describe their actions? specifically gerunds, those words that end in ing. So we could say at this moment they're doing one of these things. And it could be a unique description and as many unique descriptions as we could observe. Here's some examples on the slide. We felt that we had nicely operationalized these because we had a nice agreement between readers. Our Kappa statistic was 0.89 to 0.99 on all of these. So it may not be how others would define quality of play, but it's how we operationalized it, and we felt that we had a reliable measure. Okay. Put the data, obviously, in Excel and used SPSS. They were not normally distributed, um, so we compared kids to themselves using a Wilcoxon. And then we did some correlation analysis using Spearman. Because we had three dependent variables, we adjusted our alpha by three. Yeah. Any questions there? Since you're maybe not a room full of quantitative researchers, was that Greek? <laughs> As they say, yes. Okay, fair enough. Ask questions later, like what, or as we look at the data. All right, so here are the results. Where the number of times they picked up a toy to play and then stopped in the four toy condition here, averaged right around 10. And in the 16 toy condition, approached 20. And so twice as many times in the 16 toy condition did they approach a toy and play with it and then walk away or change or have their focus drift off. They could play as long as they wanted but the kid who played the least amount of time defined the amount of time or data that we analyzed. 
so that we could create the same amount of play for every participant. So we cut it at 15 minutes. We, um, they, the first two minutes didn't count because they were walking in the room and assessing and they may play in that first two minutes, but not all of them did. So we didn't look at the first two and then we looked at the next 15. Thanks for asking. Yeah, so that we had all of that, the same amount of play time for all of them. Okay. The average play time was 20 minutes. One kid, we um, had to start putting the toys away so they would leave. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the one kid played for 15 minutes, like 15 and 33 seconds, and was like, I I'm all done. So that worked. Okay. So they changed toy play significantly more often, or they had more incidences of toy play when there were 16 toys. So math being what it is, right, we had 15 minutes of play, and they switched nearly 20 times, so their epics had to be shorter. Right? So the duration of epics measured in seconds was fewer than 60. Okay? So they'd walk up to a toy, play with it for less than 60 seconds, and then switch and move to another toy. Because that needed to happen you know, almost 20 times in that 15 minute period for the data to fall out like this. Whereas in the four toy condition, they played for almost two minutes. Now, American pediatricians give parents the rule of thumb that your child's attention span should be as many minutes as they are years old. And I don't know how much water that holds, but as a rule of thumb, maybe it works and here we, our two-year-olds were uh, approaching attending for two minutes of play in a condition that had four toys available to them also it seemed as if they were going to play with every toy in the room right? essentially in the four toy condition most of them played with all four toys and then they might have revisited it to get to this 10 incident, right? So in your example here, back and back, right? Certainly, but they did, you know, most of the kids, um, that looks to be about 17 of them, touched, played with every toy in the room. And most of them, in the 16 toy condition, played with at least six, and many of them with more. Interestingly, nobody played with all 16 of them. So there may be a ceiling effect, right, to the number of toys in the room that, you know, it doesn't matter if you have 16 or 50, right, they're going to perhaps play with in and around 10 of the toys that are available to them. But if you pull in, if you limit the number of toys, right, that it, you, they'll still play with all of them, but their play incidences may be less interrupted. Some of the kids who played longer on the clock longer were not leaving the room until they had a chance to play with every toy there. Right? Uh, we have this social media or this texting acronym FOMO, fear of missing out. Right? That you know they're afraid that there's something there that I didn't touch and play with, and I don't know what I'm missing by not touching and playing with it. And I get that. I get the inclination to explore your environment and know what's there. But if there's a lot in your environment, that might mean these little interrupted bits of play where you're flitting about. And in the video, with 16 toys in, some of the toddlers did look downright frenetic. Just toy to toy to toy to toy. Just, you know, a minute's time is not much time. They pick it up and you know, fiddle with it, set it back down, and rush almost to the next. Okay. And so this in, interacted with what they did with the toys when they had them in their hands. They ex I think they explored more of the affordances of the toy. So it began with picking it up, turning it around, poking fingers in, pushing buttons or lifting levers if they were there, but it moved into what happens when I, right? What happens when I pull hard? What happens when I put this there? What happens when I turn it around? Or can I combine this toy with that toy? And so for manners of play, we had many more verbs associated with the four toy epic uh, sessions than we did with the 16 toy. 
So, oops, sorry. Um, right around seven manners of play in a 15 minute interval, right? Where here with four toys, they approached 12 different ways of playing. The more exploratory verbs seem to occur earlier in play ethics. And the more advanced ones where they're pretending or combining or starting to hold up an animal at their parent and go, you know, moo and move it around, those seem to happen later in a play epic. So they needed to have that time to get there in their play. We had an artificial cutoff on how long they played, and so they skewed toward that cutoff. Um, and I am very much interested in what happened after 15 minutes for those kids who stayed and played. And I have, I do have the data. I think they're worth looking at. Because on the individual level, some kids just may need more time to get to those more sophisticated play behaviors, play performances. And that may be part of the message. You know, I don't know yet. I can't say from the data. But part of the message may be that if you want to see a child develop sophistication, they may need more dedicated time to doing it. Just wasn't quite the hypothesis that we tested in this round of analysis. This study got published, like the, it hit the, the wire, as they say, uh, on about December 2nd. Uh, so my kids say that I ruined Christmas. <laughs> I do not know that this study would have gotten anybody's attention published any other time of the year. But when scientific journal writer, journal, uh, journalist read sort of just the abstract and the title, right, and it's Christmas time coming, and the headlines were buy your kids fewer toys. Right? Uh, or give fewer presents, or take toys away from kids, as one blogger put it, right? And my kids were like, Mom, I know. My, my sister-in-law texted me and called me the Grinch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, you know, and I, there are so many limitations to this study because it's minimalistic, because it's reductionistic. We had two conditions, and we measured three pretty tight dependent variables. And all we can say is that these 36 kids, when presented with toys to play with in our lab, played with them thusly. Right. And here are those data. Um, and I'm happy to just share them with you so that I don't take more of the time. Um, but it, I'm, and I haven't done any statistical analysis, but nothing really jumped out at me as toys that they avoided or toys that they preferred and gravitated toward. Thank you. I got well into myself, and I'm sorry I didn't know what that was the time.